friends I've made in, in the past. And it's been really enjoyable. It's been a refreshing, very refreshing time for me. The topic that <clears throat> I've been assigned is casting down what exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And that topic certainly uh, is uh, one of uh, supreme significance and importance. In fact, it's a topic uh, which uh, runs constantly through Scripture. The first onslaught against the knowledge of God in human history occurred in that lovely yet tragic garden we call Eden, when God had made such wonderful provisions and given such great privilege to our first parents. We know the story as it's recorded there in Genesis 3, the serpent more subtle and crafty than any of God's creatures came to Eve and said, did God really say that you're not to eat of any of the trees in the garden? And she immediately responds, why, why no? He said we can eat of any of the trees except that one that is in the center of the garden. If we eat of that one, he said, we shall die. And that old serpent hissed back, you'll not surely die. Why? God's trying to pull wool over your eyes. You know that if you eat of that tree, you'll know good and evil, and you'll be like God. And that temptation to be like God is the first attempt to undermine the very authority and knowledge and word of God. And Eve, of course, uh, did succumb to that temptation. She tempted her husband to also succumb, and sin entered that lovely, perfect spot as God's veracity is questioned, as his word is ignored, and as his knowledge is undermined. And thus, here, in this great book that we have, from which we can understand all there is to know about God and how we can come to know God in that personal way. Here in this book, we have the introduction to that great fact that will not only be present as this book unfolds, but we see that fact as we look about us today in the world in which we live, that God and his knowledge has been solid and pilloried, and indeed, he has been called into question as far as his goodness is concerned in relationship to his creatures. And that first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis set that stage from which we look at the rest of human history. And as sin grows and develops as rebellion becomes even greater and more extensive. The final climactic picture is seen as those who there on the plain of Shinar decide they will build a tower that reaches to heaven. And God looks down and says, they'll do it. And he has to come down and confuse their language so that man made in God's image, given those great uh, characteristics that we know man possesses, of rationality and creativity. Man who has now sinned and stands in rebellion can indeed do these kinds of things. And God was not willing for that to, ac to be accomplished because he was setting forth into the world that great scheme of redemption by which he could restore mankind to himself, and by which he could bring man back to that place where they could understand that he and he alone was all of the authority, and they must turn from their autonomous, sinful, rebellious ways. In fact, you see, when God is ignored and undermined and denied, as he certainly is seen, to be there in those early chapters, we find the kinds of consequences, the kinds of results that are not only spelled out here in a Holy Writ, but the kinds of results and consequences that we see generally 
even down to this day in our world. In fact, we could uh, look at the Old Testament and say, just as the book of Hebrews has that great chapter in which the great heroes of the faith could be listed, we could develop a similar list of billions of faithlessness and rebellion. And like Hebrew, uh, like the Hebrew writer uh, does, we could also want to say the same thing. What more can I say? For time would fail me to tell of Cain and Lamech and a Pharaoh who not Joseph, Korah, Saul, all the kings of the northern kingdom of Israel, many of the kings of Judah. And we could bring that list perhaps to close with that picture of King Jehoiakim slashing away with his penknife at that scroll upon which the word of God coming through Jeremiah had come to him and his people. And there with his face flushed with wine, sitting among his advisors in his luxurious palace, he took those remnants that were slashed from the scroll and burnt them, supposing that he could destroy the word of God, that he could bring an end to the knowledge of God. This is the kind of thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And as one moves over into the New Covenant Scriptures uh, and that sees that great statement there in the first chapter of Romans, one could recognize that here is a summarization of those generations of sinful humanity who had rejected the knowledge of God, and it is projected as a continued summarization of that rejection, that rebellion, that continues on down to this present day. And so we read there, beginning in the 18th verse, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known, and the original here lying behind that expression could very well be translated, God is knowable. For what could be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nation, divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God, nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened, and although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles, and therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another, and they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised a man. Then note there in verse 28, Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. And beyond that tragic picture, as we see it both prior to those statements made by the inspired apostle, and as we see it since that time, we see, of course, the shadowy outline of that same great enemy of God who was there in the garden, bringing these things to pass through his wiles and his machinations so that man in rebellion, man in his sinful, prideful autonomy stands over against God, attempting to destroy the knowledge of God, the will of God. And certainly it's no wonder that Paul could contrast man's reason, his autonomous reason with God's, showing paradoxically, as he does there in that the great chapter, 1 Corinthians 1, that man's wisdom is nothing compared to the foolishness of God, and man emphasizing that it is only God's foolishness 
and God's weakness as demonstrated in a cross that can save and provide all things through Christ, who, as Paul says there in verse 30, who is our wisdom, our righteousness, our holiness, our redemption. Amen. It's because of this picture of sin, rebellion, and worldly wisdom, which leaps from the pages of Scripture and is there in our experience day by day, that the church has been given those great tasks of evangelism, of calling men away from Satan to the kingdom of God, evangelism of preaching that word which alone can bring redemption, evangelism of making disciples and baptizing and teaching, and that is the task which the church has been given. But there is another task, and that's the task which we call apologetics, or in quoting that great passage from Peter, we are always to be able to give an apologia of reason, a defense for the hope that lies within us. Because you see, we stand and we work and we labor and we are constantly bombarded bombarded in an age where those kinds of secularistic humanism, whatever kind of euphemistic terminology may be, are used today, have constantly threatened us if we are concerned about the greatness of God, His Word, and His knowledge. And each of us must, I think, see our place in these great tasks of the church in order to see that the knowledge of God becomes supreme over all those things that have been exalted against his knowledge. And like Paul, we must recognize, as he writes there in 2 Corinthians 10, that uh, though we live in this world, we do not wage war as the world wages war, beginning there in verse 3. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world, on the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Amen. Amen. That's our task, evangelism, apologetics. Because as we engage in these activities, which are the very heart of the Christian faith, the Christian body, as we engage in these, we are involved in destroying and casting down those things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. But it may be that our failures in these outreach ministries of the Lord's people, evangelism and apologetics, have resulted because as God's people, we have not cast down those things that in our own lives exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. And I want to, just for a few moments, take my text from Paul's uh, great uh, letter to the Philippians, chapter 3. It seems to me that Paul there is talking about the kinds of things that he faced, as he indeed recognized that kind of threat, those kinds of uh, situations and uh, patterns of thought that could very easily exalt themselves to the place that God's not and God's will would somehow be undermined, or at least if not undermined, would be effectively limited. As we read there in that third chapter, we find first of all that Paul says that he cannot, he must not, have confidence in the flesh. And if you look over there in verses 18 and 19 in that uh, same chapter, you'll note uh, that he warns those to whom he is writing. He says, I have often told you before, and now I say it again with tears. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. And then he goes on to, in, in some sense, point out what that enmity involves. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, their belly, as the King James says. 
and their glory is in their shame. So often we allow fleshly concerns to, in some way, not only give us confidence, but cause us to stray away from that full commitment to the will of God. We have come into this new life in our immersion into Christ, and we recognize that the symbolism there not only says that we have died, but the old man is buried, but somehow or other we uh, do not allow the old man to be buried, or when he shows his ugly face, we do not follow that which Paul so clearly points out. We do not put him to death. Amen. Put him to death. Amen. And make out of that kind of destructive death a deeper commitment to him who must be our life. Yeah. And so yeah. Paul knew that as a threat. He knew that as a genuine danger. He's not only pointing out that that was true about others, he was even referring to himself. And over in 1 Corinthians 9, as you recall, he talks about the discipline of self to which, which he applied to himself. And he says, uh, I, I don't, uh, and he uses some of that uh, imagery that comes out of the, of the games of, of, that, uh, of that century and, and of that culture. And he says, I, I don't run aimlessly, without a goal, without a purpose. And I certainly don't shadow box. But I buffet my body, I keep it in subjection. I make a slave out of myself in order that once I've summoned others, to participate in the games, if we could use this kind of free translation, I myself might find that I've been disqualified. You see, we must be aware of how the flesh and fleshly mindedness can indeed become that which opposes the knowledge of God. And certainly if, if that great apostle uh, could uh, see that as a, as a threat in his own life, See, that is a danger, and warn about that danger as he writes uh, in so many other passages about that very thing, then we too ought to recognize that that is a danger to us, and immediately following the pattern that Paul sets forth and keeping our eyes centered upon Jesus and allowing his spirit to grow and develop as he intends within us, we might put to death all of those fleshly desires and learn to live solely for him, that is, for King Jesus alone. But no, second, there's pride. Uh, beginning there in verse 4, Paul says, uh, I have reason for confidence. Uh, he says, I have uh, been circumcised on the eighth day. Uh, I belong to the people of Israel. In fact, I belong to that uh, second tribe, the tribe of Benjamin, one of those faithful tribes. So I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And uh, as far as the law is concerned, uh, I'm a part of that Pharisaic party, much concerned about the law. And as for zeal, why, I persecuted the church. And as for legalistic righteousness, I was false. Now that's the kind of pride that uh, Paul could refer to as he looks at his past. And sometimes uh, I think we uh, have some real problems uh, in just that uh, area as well. Because he says, all of this, I see as uh, Brother Fred uh, indicated, uh, I see as dung, as refuge, as rubbish, in order that I might win Christ. In order that I might come to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. Because, as he says there in verse 10, I want to know Him. Amen. And the power of his resurrection. Amen. Amen. And you see, it's in that kind of contrast that we need to see those kinds of things which in our prideful autonomy we often uh, uh, perhaps uh, give more uh, attention to than in the service of Jesus Christ in our Lord. Amen. We may take pride in our education. We may take pride in the prestige, uh, the position that uh, we may have. We can even take pride, this kind of sinful pride that Paul's talking about, in our spiritual 
righteousness, I was wrong. And it could very well be, if Brother Fred mentioned that rich young ruler, someone did, it could very well be that uh, at one time, the Saul of Tarsus could have been that rich young ruler. Because that's the kind of pride he had in the accomplishments that he had made. And there are other passages that say, for example, in the Galatian letter, I went far beyond my contemporaries in the Lord and in my father. You see, here Paul says, in spite of all of this, and, and we certainly do not discount the way God used all of that rich past uh, in such a way that it contributed to uh, Paul's ministry and Paul's power and the use of Paul as his chosen instrument. But you see, those things could never be the basis of this kind of confident and sinful pride. They must be cast aside, cast down, because if they are not properly used, if they're not properly disciplined, if they're not properly seen, then they can stand over against the knowledge of God. Amen. And it's a constant struggle, Paul points out there, and verse 12 and following. He says, I, I've not obtained this. I've not been made perfect. But I press on to take hold of that for which Jesus Christ took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is past, I strain toward that which is ahead, and I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Yeah, amen. We never, we never have an opportunity to sit back, to rest on our own, and to assume that we have no responsibility in continuing to handle these kinds of uh, attitudes and problems and so forth so that we might, like Paul, constantly strain forth to the future in order that we might win him. Amen. Amen. And then, of course, uh, underlying Paul's uh, concern is a deep concern for combating uh, both of those uh, attitudes and patterns of life that we have in more recent years given the words legalism and liberalism. Paul was constantly concerned about Jewish legalism. In fact, here he says that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, and, and have that righteousness which is not my own, but that righteousness which comes from him, that righteousness that comes through Christ. He was constantly recognizing that in spite of what attainments he may have had, in spite of the way that he had attempted to keep the law, there could never be that kind of uh, righteousness coming through law keeping. There could only be righteousness when it is given in terms of the grace of God and accepted on the part of those who have come to realize that they are poor and wretched and blind and they must cast themselves solely and permanently upon King Jesus, the King of grace, and upon the living God who alone grants mercy and hope for the future and for the present. Amen. You see, you not only have liberalism and legalism, in our day, you have it going all the way back into Paul's day. So he talks about those who are enemies of the cross of Christ. He talks about the resurrection. Over in 1 Corinthians, he is a very, very concerned that those Corinthians understand that the resurrection is that factual basis of our faith. And without the resurrection, there is no hope. There is uh, nothing but futility. Yeah. There is yeah. nothing at all for us to, to build life upon. And therefore, those great themes that are set forth in Scripture that reflect what God has done must constantly be emphasized and proclaimed and preached so that Indeed, upon that basis, we may live out our lives redeemed by the blood and saved by the grace of God, lives that are indeed faithful lives because we know that God has done this in our behalf. Amen. Now, there's a, an illustration that I'd like to use here. 
for the fateful year in the history of that movement of which most of us are a part, which we call the Restoration Movement, 1889. And in the summer of that year, about this time, a group of brethren, in fact some 6,000, had gathered down in Shelby County, Illinois, below what is now Decatur, at Sand Creek. And uh, they'd imported some speakers, just like we've done here. <laughs> One of those speakers was Daniel Salk. And uh, whereas uh, that movement had sort of begun with the great declaration of grass of Thomas Hamm, Daniel Sauber uh, proceeded to produce an address and declaration. And in that, to make a long story short, he says, any of those who think that they are brethren to us who continue to engage in any of these kind of innovations, and most of those innovations were things that were not revealed in Scripture that were based upon the silence. And all of those, unless they desist, we will no longer consider brethren. And we think of that year, 1889, and that particular event is perhaps the beginning of that kind of legalism that drew lines and separated from brethren and in which the lovelessness of these past many, many years uh, began to be expressed. But just a hundred miles away, over a simple Christian church in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, a young, dynamic, forceful orator had just recently come to that church named R.C. And because uh, he was uh, perhaps supported by some uh, uh, people who were sort of free thinkers, he too began to develop that kind of free thought. And first thing you know, he was preaching in such a way as to say that there are no standards and no tests of fellowship at all. Uh, if anyone wants to uh, become a member of this congregation, uh, as long as he's got a clear conscience, uh, that's fine. We're not going to make any tests of fellowship. And that became such a, uh, a problem within that congregation, without, within the whole city of St. Louis, and ultimately throughout the brotherhood, that O.J.H. Harris, who was a member of that congregation, headed to the Christian Evangelist, had to take his stand. And not only opposed that, but ultimately that uh, was uh, brought to an end left and uh, in a sense moved into a living because uh, he's never known of uh, uh, as far as the movement is concerned from that time on until later in his life when by the way Stanford Publishing uh, does publish uh, a little manual a minister's manual that he, that he edited but you see here was liberalism also coming in at the same time denying the very faith that was so basic as seen and revealed in Scripture. And it's in that kind of context that we continue to live in our day. For all of these are constantly threatening us. These are the kinds of things that are exalted against the knowledge of God. And what's the answer? Well, again, go back to that third chapter of Philippians. For and Fred referred to this as the moth of translation of that uh, uh, expression, where he says, uh, our citizenship is in heaven. Uh, we're a colony of heaven, is what uh, Paul is saying. Exactly. And of course, this has a particular import to these uh, Philippians, because that's what the city of Philippi was. It was a colony of heaven, uh, a colony of Rome, if you please, uh, planted right there in that strategic area in order that not only could Rome's interests be accomplished, but those who were privileged to live there and be citizens of that colony, therefore citizens of Rome, might indeed recognize their privilege and their position and live in a way that would indeed reflect that. That's why Paul later could uh, demand that those leaders, political leaders of that city, not only come down to the jailhouse, and apologize for what they had done in beating him and Silas without any kind of trial. And that's why I think Paul 
was so insistent that they do that and then lead them back probably to uh, that house where they were staying there and thus say to this, this whole city that here were Roman citizens who had been ill-treated and they ought not to be particularly in this kind of colony which is directly responsible to Rome. Now that's what Paul is saying to the, uh, the Philippian church. You're a colony, not of Rome, but of heaven. Amen. But your privilege and position is even much greater Amen. than those who may be merely parts of those colonies of Rome. For you belong to the new Jerusalem, and your names are written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. And you have a hope far beyond any hope that the Pax Romana could ever give. Your hope is in eternal things, not in earthly things. Amen. But you also have that same kind of responsibility, only even that responsibility is greater. Because as you live as salt and light in this world as a city set up on a hill, you are to make known the glorious knowledge of the living God. And, and the thing, as, as we talked about incentive yesterday, the thing that gives incentive is what he goes on to say. From whence, see, our, we're a colony of heaven. And from heaven, we look for the coming of Jesus. Amen. 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 Oh, we, we, I think one of the things that we've forgotten tonight, I may take off on a digression here, students uh, refer to. <laughs> I think one of the things we forget about uh, what the New Testament presents is this great expectancy that centers around uh, the Lord's coming. Amen. The Lord's sure coming. Amen. Amen. So we, we look from heaven uh, for that one who shall come, the Lord Jesus, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, the power is there to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Amen. Amen. We don't know what we're going to be like, John tells us, but we know this. When he appears, we shall be like him. Amen. And that's, a, that's a glorious promise. But the point is, if that promise is to be enjoyed, then we've got to be like him now. Right? Amen. I think of that uh, little bit of What's the chorus actually of a gospel song, which uh, certainly expresses this, this very truth that this is the way in which the knowledge of God can not only be enhanced in our lives in all of those associations that we have, and in which all of those powers and forces and attitudes that stand over against them can be struck down. If we have this as our desire, oh, to be like me, oh, to be. Blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art, come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thine own image deep on my heart. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we're so thankful that we do know you. And that knowledge comes to us through that revealed word. Amen. And it centers in the wonderful grace that you've given us in and through Jesus, your Son. We pray 